Augmandino's University of Success Semester 2 kicks off with a guiding principle from an Eastern European man born way back between 342 and 347, and his name was Jerome. And Jerome grew up to become one of the Christian fathers of the Catholic Church. And because of his writings and teachings, Jerome has since been designated by the Catholic Church as Saint Jerome. Jerome was a monk and once described himself as a eunuch by choice, a eunuch by choice, a eunuch for the kingdom. Jerome lived for a time in Rome. And while he was living in Rome, Jerome was often associated with nobles, with rich, powerful, and influential people of his day. One of whom was a wealthy patrician woman, she was a widow, named Eustochium Julia, E-U-S-T-O-C-H-I-U-M, Eustochium. Julia, hereafter referred to as EJ. And around the year 384, this wealthy widowed woman, EJ, made a vow of perpetual virginity. In other words, as we would say today, she took the veil and became a nun. And in her new life as a renunciate, Jerome became her spiritual advisor and mentor. And Jerome often wrote letters or epistles to EJ providing instruction and encouragement in her spiritual development as a nun. EJ is now considered one of the desert mothers of Christianity. They're desert mothers, there are desert fathers. These are nuns and monks who left the more urban areas and went out into the desert and cloistered themselves in communities for the lifelong study of God and contemplation of spiritual things. Some call this the contemplative life. So St. Jerome and EJ were among those. In one of those letters that St. Jerome wrote to EJ as her spiritual advisor and mentor, St. Jerome wrote this, as often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, Transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. Now, brothers and sisters, this bears repeating several times. St. Jerome. And this letter was written in 383 or 384 in our common era. Jerome wrote, As often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. And it is from this letter and this quote that Augmandino derives his guiding principle for semester two of his 1982 book, University of Success. The guiding principle for semester two of the University of Success is from St. Jerome. Begin to be now what you will be hereafter. Begin to be now what you will be hereafter. And I do want to say one thing about that because context is key. Context is key. And we see that Brother Augmandino is only using the last part of St. Jerome's quote. The full sentence, as I read, is, As often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So let's get into it. The second semester of Augmandino's University of Success kicks off with this thought from St. Jerome. As often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. Begin to be now what you will be hereafter. All right, so let's get it. In January of 1979, Keith 
DeGreen's book, Creating a Success Environment, was published. And it is from Keith DeGreen that we receive the guiding thought for Lesson 6, How to Accept the Challenge of Success. The guiding thought for Lesson 6 is this. To succeed means that you may have to step out of line and march to the sound of your own drummer. In Lesson 6, how to Accept the Challenge of Success. Author Keith DeGreen, in his 1979 book, Creating a Success Environment, asks 12 questions. 12 questions. So get your pen, <laughs> get your paper, get your device, and jot down these 12 questions. And in your quiet time, go back and contemplate the answers to these 12 questions posed by Mr. Keith DeGreen in his 1979 book, Creating a Success Environment. These are the questions. Number one, do you really believe you were put here to fail? Do you really believe you were put here to fail? That's the first question. Number two, is it wrong to be rich? Is it wrong to be rich? Number three, do you have to go through hell to get to heaven? Do you have to go through hell to get to heaven? Question number four, isn't being here all the permission you need? Isn't being here all the permission you need? Question five, who will control your life? Who will control your life? That's the fifth question. Number six, were you designed to be led? Were you designed to be led? Number seven, do you prefer mediocrity? Because some people do. Do you prefer mediocrity? Question number eight, do you accept responsibility for you? Do you accept responsibility for you? Number nine, will you prevent your own success? Will you prevent your own success? Number 10, do you feel that you deserve success? Do you feel that you deserve success? Question number 11, will you wait for the world to come to you? Will you wait for the world to come to you? And the last question is, will you act now? Will you act now? Those are the 12 questions. And 12, brothers and sisters, is a powerful spiritual number. And anytime you are decoding numbers, turn to Brother E.W. Bullinger and to his book, Number in Scripture. It's supernatural design and spiritual significance. Brother E.W. Bullinger was born in 1837 and died, left his body, ascended in 1913. And Number in Scripture was originally published in 1921. So now let us go back and dig a little deeper on some of these questions. Question one, do you really believe you were put here to fail? Mr. Keith DeGreen on page 53 directs us to the biblical story of the parable of the talents, the parable of the talents, which you can find in the biblical book of Matthew chapter 25. So go there, ponder that parable and see what your higher self says to you about this question. Do you really believe you were put here to fail? Question number two. Is it wrong to be rich? Page 54. Mr. Keith DeGreen writes, to the extent that money is a measure of the services we perform for others, its accumulation is noble. To the extent that we press our money into the service of those we love to provide them with as warm and as comfortable and as secure an existence as possible, its disbursement is inspired and divine. Question number three, do you have to go through hell to get to heaven? Page 55, if our being here proves anything, it is that we must accept 
the challenge of using the tools and talents that we possess. Our purpose is to make our lives as successful and as happy as we possibly can. Rather than being a mantle of suffering, we should view our existence here as a dress rehearsal for the eternity of happiness we deserve. Question number four. Isn't being here all the permission you need? Page 55. To succeed requires that we step out of line, away from the pack, and march to the sound of our personal distant drummer. So we wait for the voice of some subconscious teacher to excuse us from the room before we begin. Yet that voice will never come unless it comes from us. Question number seven. Now, the number seven is a master number. Brother E.W. Bullinger writes that seven is the great number of spiritual perfection. Question number seven. Do you prefer mediocrity? Page 58. Mr. Keith DeGreen writes, Man generally is not equipped for mediocrity. His imagination is merciful. Generally, we cannot imagine those things that we cannot accomplish. In the classic self-help volume, Think and Grow Rich, by Napoleon Hill. It is written, quote, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, he can achieve, end quote. We would not be equipped with the ability to imagine future accomplishment and conditions if we were not correspondingly equipped with the ability to turn those imaginings into reality. But mediocrity may look comfortable. We all know those who have settled into a routine job at a routine salary and who live in a routine home in a routine neighborhood. They seem routinely comfortable and happy, at least from the outside, but on the inside, they must contend daily with the rationalizations they have accepted and the non-use of the abilities that they possess. The tension thus created is anything but comfortable. Question number eight. Do you accept responsibility for you? Page 59. We frequently use diversion in our lives as a tool to avoid direct confrontation with our innermost feelings and to avoid accepting total responsibility for who we are and what we do. One more again, because diversion and distraction, brothers and sisters, are major stumbling blocks for so many of us. So let's rewind that. We frequently use diversion in our lives as a tool to avoid direct confrontation with our innermost feelings and to avoid accepting total responsibility for who we are and what we do. Question number 10. Do you feel that you deserve success? Page 60. How can you not deserve success? Your success is not measured relative to what others say or do or accomplish. It is merely the extent to which you utilize the potential that you possess. If part of your personal potential package includes a tendency to be forgetful or clumsy or whatever, that element makes you no less deserving of success. It is merely part of the total you. It is a characteristic that must, in its own way, be made to work for you when at all possible. But others, you think, are obviously smarter or younger or harder working or more educated or better looking. They deserve success more than I do, you think. But the characteristics of others remain irrelevant to your success. Let's rewind that. But the characteristics of others remain irrelevant to your success. While the tendency to compare ourselves to others may be overwhelming, it is not against them we compete. Page 61. It is only our tendency not to utilize all the potential we possess against which we must constantly fight. Success is not something that must be deserved or earned. It is more an inherent right, an inherent responsibility. The only qualification for success is that you be you. 
that you utilize whatever combination of talent you possess to the fullest extent possible. Do you deserve success? Of course you do. You deserve no less. Question number 11. Will you wait for the world to come to you? Page 61. The next time you catch yourself daydreaming, about someone or something coming to you, stop yourself and resolve to do whatever is necessary to go to him or her or they or it. If indeed the world ever does beat a path to your door, it will do so only after it first discovers who you are and where you can be reached. You must supply the world with this information. That's the key, brothers and sisters. You must supply the world with this information. What information? Who you are and where you can be located. You must let it know, the world, that you are here, that you are eager to do business, and that you offer to the world something of value to it. We must resist our tendency to believe that the world will come to us, that things will happen to us. We must go to it. We must happen to things. There is nothing as sad as the man who spends his entire life waiting for his ship to come in when he never sent one out. Don't spend your life waiting for that quote unquote big break. Don't rely upon luck. Make your own. Your talent may be enormous. Your potential may be great, but talent and potential unannounced to the rest of the world is wasted. Question number 12. Will you act now? Page 62. There are few who have the right to criticize. Only those who stand by our side on the firing line and to suffer the same challenges as we do, possess the right. Only those who, as Theodore Roosevelt said, are with us in the arena with soiled hands and sweaty brows and a sense of purpose and daring and dedication may criticize us. For now is the only time that we have. That's worth repeating. For now is the only time that we have. It is our only negotiable currency. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. It is only today that we may spend in the noble effort of using all the gifts that God gave us. 